please take your seats. The session is about to start. Okay, good evening everybody, and welcome to the final session of the day, almost. <laughs> Rumor has it there's a party after this, so we'll call that a session. So this is then the last one of today sitting on the stage, Harmony and Coexistence. It's an incredibly important theme in so many ways here at WEF when we're thinking about the world, how we live in harmony with our countries, with our nations, with our opinions, and now there's another thing to also think about with harmony and our coexistence, which is AI. And this is what the theme is here in the AI, AI house tonight, navigating the future of the AI human partnership. We have an incredible panel who I've been very privileged to meet today. <laughs> and um, I'm looking forward to the conversation for the next hour. So I'm gonna ask them to introduce themselves because I could not do them justice. And so I'm gonna start right here with Aurelio. And I'm a neuroscientist, and I work in, uh, in Japan um, on research, so academic research at the boundary between uh, human neuroscience and AI, especially how the human brain and uh, AI models um, align. Uh, be very, I'm very excited to the discussion that will take place here today. Great. Thank you, Aurelio. Guillaume. So my name is Guilherme Martinez Roura. I'm uh, the AI and Robotics Program Officer at the ITU, which is the International Telecommunication Union. It's the United Nations Specialized Agency for ICTs. And as well, I'm part of the organizing team of the uh, AI for Good Global Summit. Thank you. Thank you very much. James. I'm James Landay. I'm a professor of computer science and also the co-founder and one of the co-leaders now of the Stanford Institute for Human-Centered AI. Great, thank you. And uh, last but not least. <laughs> Thanks, um, I'm Mena Lassati. I'm a pro also a professor of computer science, but at ETH Zurich. Um, my research is on human AI partnership and interaction, and I'm a core faculty member at the ETH AI Center. So as you can see, we have a great international crowd here to dig into this topic. So the first thing I'd like to ask each of you, and I'm going to start with Mina, if I could start with you, is the title. This Harmony Coexistence, what does this mean for you, the a human AI partnership? Yeah. So this panel, I think, is very important because we've seen how AI can change a lot of uh, our interaction and also like the way we um, gather knowledge, the way we analyze problems. But we've only seen very specific types of interactions between humans and AIs in the last years. We've had natural language interfaces with ChatGPT and so on. Um, and I think if we want to create a coexistence and a harmony in the future, we need to really think about a seamless interaction between humans and AIs that is trustworthy, and that has a lot of the mechanisms that we expect from a human-human interaction. So uh, looking into what we expect from our uh, fellow humans, uh, people we meet, how we interact with each other, and thinking about how we can create harmony, not just for ourselves, but for uh, the entire society in partnership with maybe AI agents, um, is something that is very crucial and also very important for uh, my research. Yeah. Curious. Okay, great. Thank you. I'm going to come over to this end. Otherwise, it gets boring going back and forth, back and forth. So, I heard it was... 
Your take. So it was my take. So as a, as, as a scientist or someone who works on, uh, on basic questions uh, to understand maybe the brain and AI, when I think of this partnership, uh, I, I, I tend to think about it in a sort of a very long-term um, view, let's say. Uh, and one of the ways that, uh, that we actually also think about it uh, in the lab is how humans, or the human brain especially, um, can align with, uh, with AI. One of the things that, uh, that right now AI is becoming pervasive, but still AI processes information in a different manner from the brain. Uh, mm. Um, AI makes choices that sometimes are uh, very similar to humans, but sometimes very different. Uh, mm. And so I think this, this partnership or this coexistence will have to build on these similarities and differences. Uh. And I think for as we go forward, we would hope that uh, um, they become more and more similar. That way we'd have sort of probably better um, coexistence. Mm. Interesting, because I think partnerships and coexistence is two different types of things. So I want to come back to that with all of you in a second. Kieran, what about you? Yeah, so I think uh, I, I, when, when we envision uh, the future of the AI, and, uh, and as well, I, I'm here as well on my robotics role, so I would say AI and as well embedded AI, for example, on robotic systems and the future of society, I think from uh, uh, the UN perspective, it's very important that this future of partnership is like really uh, looking into how we can solve some of the humanity's bigger challenges. Mm -hmm. So we have AI that can really uh, help support 70% of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And uh, currently, we are uh, only 15% of them have been achieved. We have our tar uh, target year, 2030. And, uh, 20% of the goals are as well like going uh, backwards. Mm -hmm. So it's like uh, from like really the UN perspective is how AI technologies can uh, work together with humans, how can you know like collaborative robots uh, uh, work together with humans in different settings, in different settings in which uh, they can positively contribute to the, to the sustainable development goals. That is our framework that we believe that is the framework of collaboration and the coexistence that should be like really combining AI and humans in the future. So that's the, that's the, the take on, about, like on the UN side. Yeah. Great. Thank you. You brought two more, two more words in. Collaboration, co-working. So now we have partnership, coexistence, collaboration, co-working. James, what's your take on this? Okay. Well, my take about predicting the future is actually to look to the past. So, you know, AI may be big in people's minds in the last year due to some of the developments with ChatGPT, but this is a very old field. Mm -hmm. If we think about it, it's about 70 years mm -hmm. in terms of the name of the field. Um, John McCarthy gave the name of the field. He actually founded the Stanford AI Lab in the early 60s. And if we go back to the early 60s, there were really two big things going on in technology right there at Stanford. One was McCarthy with AI, this idea of we can automate tasks and have machines do them. But in another part of the ecosystem there at the Stanford Research Institute, a man named Doug Engelbart was trying to solve the problem of intelligence augmentation. And he was motivated by the big problems facing the planet, population growth, lack of food, poverty, environmental degradation, what do you know, we still seem to have these problems. And Doug was really focused on intelligence augmentation, so IA instead of AI as the way to do this. Mm -hmm. As part of that, he invented the user interface that you still use today on your, on your laptop, on your phone. You know, we've added two fingers and we've added bitmap graphics instead of uh, text, but he invented the mouse, the windows, mm -hmm. uh, 30 other key things that you use today. But the bigger idea of intelligence augmentation, I think, was waiting for AI to actually work. And so what I see now is these two ideas of AI and intelligence augmentation coming together today, and that's how we should push AI forward as a way of not replacing people, but augmenting our intelligence, helping us do what we're good at already, do it better, and take away some of the tasks that are either odious or uh, boring that we don't wish to do. And so we should look for augmenting humans, and it's going to require a different kind of design to do it well. So, Mina, I see you shaking your head vigorously in agreement. Yeah. Tell me so more. 
I actually called my uh, lab uh, interactive visualization and intelligence augmentation because um, we are researching um, situations in which we need humans to do tasks manually, situations where we can already automate things. But there are plenty of different tasks that we need humans and AIs to work together in partnership. And in order to do that, we need a lot of different mechanisms um, down to the level of the detail of how do you actually give effective feedback that expresses the human's knowledge, that expresses the human's uh, will that, th that we want to kind of communicate to an AI model, and is it learnable for that particular model? Mm. And um, there's a lot of research going on uh, these days to actually figure out what are the modes of feedback? How do we hook it back to the actual models in order to really have that seamless um, back and forth communication from the model to the human, but also back from the humans, and especially when we're interacting with experts back to the models. Mm -hmm. I see you guys also going, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> 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 Do you have like to add another dimension to this or are you just violently agreeing? It's no, I, I can. I think one thing that at least comes to mind for this, if we're going back to the world of partnership, uh, mm -hmm. is, uh, um, is, is sort of, at the, end, at the end of the day, all of us, I think, are, are you know, we, we want to, to, to better understand uh, uh, the world, better understand reality and so on, and, and make new discoveries. And one way that, that I think really AI will play a fundamental role in that is that it will allow us to really to augment our intelligence in the sense also of to, to make new discoveries. Uh, mm. uh, I think this is already starting to play out now, mm. but I think it will become a lot more prominent as well in the future. Okay. Do you, have, do you want to add something? Yeah, yeah I, I, I wanted to point out on the description of the panel that it was mentioning the word uh, symbiosis. And, and symbiosis is like a bit different than collaboration mm -hmm. because symbiosis means that you cannot uh, work without the other, basically. And, um, and when, co when, it, uh, when it comes to robotics, for example, uh, we don't have this yet. I mean, now mm -hmm. I would say it's like more, more collaborative robotics, but potentially in the future it's going to be like really you know that you cannot accomplish your tasks mm. without you know like having uh, a robotic counterpart you know or an ai counterpart so i think uh in this sense uh the, the more like what frightens us the most and what, what we are more concerned about is how in this transition in this future collaboration sim symbiosis we have been mentioned like uh, using like many words is how we don't deepen uh, the digital divide in, uh, uh, in which we have a still like 3.8 billion people still unconnected. Mm -hmm. uh, those uh, people uh, need data, of course, like to train the, the AI models uh, in, in their, you know, like in their different settings and, and how uh, not to perpetuate the same divide that we have currently in the future mm -hmm. in this in these collaborations, that it's possible and it's gonna, uh, like, of course, like be encouraged and, and be possible in the in the in the developed countries. But how yeah. we can make sure that uh, all the world is participating and in this? And this, to me, is a, it's a design question. It's a question of intent. It's a question of how we go about what each of us in this room or in our interests or what you are doing. And James, let me ask you: and how do you see? This is how do we design this? Because it's a big word. Yeah. Love so it. first, I would mention this idea of symbiosis also goes back to the 1960s in Licklider's famous paper on human machine symbiosis is another like f paper of the Bible of our field. So uh, you, have, you have a hobby in the history yeah. of technology. Well, is that it? A, well, as an I, academic, you should know <laughs> know your field and know what's yeah. been done. Otherwise, we're going to just make the same mistakes. So yeah. oh, well, how do we design for this? We have to design for this differently because unlike most software systems, AI systems have impact beyond the direct user who's using the system. So our techniques of user-centered design, which our field has spent mm -hmm. maybe 40 years developing and took at least 25 to get industry to finally do software development that way, has to move beyond user-centered design. Okay, so what do you mean by it has impact beyond? I just didn't quite. So many AI systems impact a community beyond the direct user of the system, whether that community is people being paid to label data or whether it's people who are okay. um, subject to a decision that's made by a system. And so we need to move beyond 
just doing user-centered design, but also community-centered design, where we include these other voices in the design process, and that might even change who we think our users are. And so it has to be integrated with user-centered design. And in fact, if an AI system becomes uh, very successful, it may become ubiquitous across society. And at that point, we start to have societal scale issues, mm -hmm. problems, risks. And so we need to be thinking about what are the societal scale analyses that need to be done at design time as well. Now, this might seem really hard, and it is especially for computer scientists who are not trained at all in these type of techniques. So this means that AI teams have to be different as well. We need teams mm -hmm. that are interdisciplinary, include technologists, include designers, but also social scientists, humanists, sometimes artists, domain experts who understand the domain you're working in. They have to be in teams from the beginning all the way through a process or else you can't just bring these people in at the end and say, hey, is this safe? Should we release it? By then, there's so much momentum that they will have no power. They need to be on the team from the start. And so this kind of design is what I call human-centered AI, and that's what we're going to need to develop with these systems in a way that will reduce the risks. I think that's really quite interesting because so many times we see the unintended consequences of the introduction of technologies. If we think, you know, when the, when the internal combustion engine was created, it wasn't created to create exhaust. <laughs> to move people and what you're saying right now is we're walking into this with our eyes open trying to think hard about the other aspects in a way which probably in many ways we haven't before which is yeah and you can't r remove all risks you can reduce risks one is by having better design process two is by better education making sure our students who come and become the engineers become the business people understand the ethics and the risks of these issues and then the third is legislation and and regulation and that's to you know catch people who maybe have no ethics or and are yeah. bad behavior players in the system so none of those are a silver bullet we need to interesting focus on all of them Mina, you were just anxious to say something again. So yeah, I just awesome. wanted to um, add to what you're saying. I 100% agree. And I think um, one of the things that I keep repeating uh, when we are talking in interdisciplinary teams is that as a computer scientist, I by now know for some cases how to open up the AI black box, or at least we've been working on explainability for quite a while. But I always pose the question, how do you open up the human black box? Um, and it's, it's always this uh, challenge of like, how do you adapt to multiple different types of personalities, backgrounds, and how do you cater these systems? So we need to also invest a lot in adaptive systems that allow for contextualization, personalization, and also be aware of pitfalls in our own cognition. So for example, as humans, we tend to rationalize everything based on our own understanding and mental models, and, and be, not being aware of these aspects when designing systems for human AI interaction is a, a bi very big fallacy that we could um, go into. Yeah. Um, so I, I personally, I think there are lots of questions, and I, I would love for people to more people to work in that field, mm -hmm. uh, where we need to look into what is the exact timing of interaction or the, um, the the content that we need to communicate between the two agents and so on and so forth. Which is really great because there's also a question sort of this applied versus basic research and, and it also makes me think about what you were right at the very beginning with the neurological aspect how this it is or could or will be changing our the way we interact with everything. So what do you think is the is, Comment. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think you're actually, I, I probably have uh, two comments to make. The, the first one is really following up on, on what Mena said in the sense of, uh, so th there's obviously, a, I think, a very big challenge in, um, in, in putting together teams with, of people with very big, very different backgrounds, um, different cultures and so on. And, and possibly this is actually one way in which having sort of this close, partnership, collaboration between people and AI actually can work in a sort of closed loop system in the sense that the, the AI can pick on these patterns of behavior of cognitive biases and so on relatively quickly or easily. Mm. And this can help to sort of people to maybe to adapt and to, to recognize this and to sort of to have better communication as well within you know, teams like this. The other aspect is, is um, what I was mentioning at the beginning about the maybe the neural aspect or the, the, the brain aspect and mm. so on. Uh, um, and these similarities and differences between AI system and, uh, uh, and the brain. And I think for, 
probably for humans to, to, to fully trust AI, I think at some point they will, we, we, we will have to have systems that are maybe are different from what we have now. Mm -hmm. We might not know exactly right now what they look like, might be radically different, huh? but they might be a lot more similar in, in, in the way that they behave with you know, respect to the humans. Huh? That intrigues me. I'm trying to think, you know, from the imagination standpoint, what's going to be so different than we have now? I'm going to pause on that for just a moment. You wanted to say something. Yeah. Um, no. We um, so there, there have been like several because here we were mentioning, you know, like regulation, potential regulation, uh, legislation. There have been uh, at least some types of assessment for that look into these non-technological aspects that I think that are mentioning uh, that are being mentioned here. So that could be an option. You know, um, uh, for example, the ITU. It's uh, we have. 158 years of experience in a standardizations uh, in a standardization field. We have done benchmarking. You know, like for for example, we do this for uh, for AI uh, models in healthcare systems. Like how you know, like you you give. Um, uh, an AI application for to a health health uh, healthcare provider. How does yeah? That, how does the healthcare provider know that that's the right application that wants to use like in their uh, healthcare system? You know, and as well when when you were mentioning the the inclusive design thing, that's really important. I was uh, two two months ago in a in an event called Accessible Europe, and and uh, we were talking about AI for digital accessibility, and. Uh, the disabled community uh, was mentioning how uh, uh, they are not included from the start in the design process of the AI solutions that are being developed, mm -hmm. and that's the that's the the problem, you know, because um, you include them at the latest stage, you know, when the solution is already available in the market, and and what we are as well, like really uh, for us, is very important. Is like that minorities are included in this, uh, you know, like conception and and design, initial design process. So uh, this is coming back to again to this idea of being able to be, go walk into this eyes open, adaptive, and, and thinking about the entire spectrum of utilization. But and I'm thinking, I'm looking behind you, Daniel. It keeps looking at this word of harmony. And coexistence, it's very difficult to regulate or dictate harmony. I mean, otherwise I wouldn't be divorced, you know, this is sort of, you know, probably. But, you know, it's, it's an interesting question when we think of this for as humans, this coexistence and this role of regulation at a moment. So, it, how is this, the regulations help and how might they hinder this future coexistence and harmony? Who wants to take that one? I'll take it. I mean, regulation, you obviously have to watch out that it's not just being used to limit the entry to competitors, which is you know one worry that others have. I'm not sure regulation is going to help you too much with harmony. I think harmony, at least in the design of these, is going to be about good design, and then it's also going to be about people choosing you know, the products that work well for them, likely harmony. Where maybe regulation comes into this is um, we have problems with technical addiction. <laughs> addiction mm. meaning you use it so much that it gets in the way of your ability to carry out your normal life. We have that problem with our phones today, uh, people with uh, gaming, social networks. Now imagine this addiction with your AI agent who mm. you know, helps you do all this stuff. Mm. Um, some people will be able to handle it and mm. not have a problem, but some people this may become a problem. Mm. So one area I could see touching on harmony is how do we deal with certain uh, design things that are using AI to make things addictive. So imagine the perfect casino that can adapt to keep you playing forever right this is possible with ai and these interfaces and so that's one area where we might need to be careful because this mm. will have bad impact for a lot of people who um, are more likely to fall into addiction yep. go ahead mean and then i'm, I'm going to change yeah, the may, tact here. may add to this i mean um we've been involved in a lot of discussions in the academic context trying to figure out you know what exactly is for example trust as a concept what do we mean by it and we try to break it down and measure it and all of that but i've been also involved in a lot of discussions with like uh, more higher level uh, regulation committees um, and we're just talking about slogans and like um, trying to avoid different things and so on 
And as an optimist, <laughs> I would like to think about more of best practices. So instead of saying, don't do this and don't do that, how about we share the best practices of how it would work? What are good practices that others have tried mm. and that would make this harmony actually happen? Mm. So I think there is a lot of potential here to just spin the conversation into a positive context and try to kind of um, learn and share um, different yeah. good opinions. OK, I want to leave the R word behind now. <laughs> OK. Um, and one of the things that you were doing and many of those in this house and the conversations have been trying to reset our understanding of what normal will be. So no one, none of you are trying to recreate the past. You're trying to create a new normal for the future. And this is a conversation around the future. And the future is a very interesting space because it will come no matter what. But what are you working towards and what, in your mind, is that new normal for this future of human AI coexistence? What's that? Give us a picture how, of what that's going to look like in my life. Even though you don't really know me, just pretend. <laughs> right? I wake up. And, uh, I mean, I, it's a serious question. What's your imagination? Give me some imagination. Give me some ideas. I think your life will be more focused on the parts of your job that you really enjoy and the parts that you find tedious and, and uninspiring. You'll hopefully be able to spin those off a little bit to your AI helper of whatever form it might be. And maybe you won't work as much and you'll enjoy uh, spending your time around Zurich a little more and, and maybe meet your next wife, uh, you know, so. <laughs> well, if the AI could help me with that, that'd be kind of cool. That'd be fine, yeah. So, but so this is positive. I, I like that picture. <laughs> the whole thing's good. But where is, where is it going to be? How's it, how are we going to see it? Is this like one year away or is this 50 years away? I mean, I, I would say that we're already seeing it now. Exactly. I mean, so this is now. I mean, so this is now. How's it change? Tell me about the future. Well, I, I think uh, every. I mean, everything's changing. You know, like I, I was just talking with a, with a few professors, and they are mentioning to me like how it's going to be relevant. Like, for example, when you write a, a master dissertation, like a PhD thesis, like using AI generated text. You know, like how uh, are you going to create knowledge that is so. Um, so extremely uh, creative that could never be generated by uh, by uh, you know an AI generated text. You know, so I think uh, here, you know, for you, for example, I think that AI can really amplify uh, what what you're doing. You know, like really, mm -hmm. like uh, it's amplifying our job. You know, yeah. but so for many people, I, I would say that. Maybe there is not the knowledge. Maybe they are not trained. Maybe there is um, there's going to be like need for reskilling programs, upskilling sure. programs, because okay. to not to, to to avoid leaving uh, people behind. Okay, so I hear that. But I, I have great quotes from the 1950s, 1960s, and 1970s about each technological evolution was going to give me more time, make my life better, and etc. I'm just wondering. How is this going to be different? Um, so I think like I like to motivate the type of research that we do um, by painting a picture of um, if you imagine your interaction with anyone that you meet, right? Um, you might use verbal, nonverbal communication. You might um, pull out your phone and show them something. Um, you might just like um, draw a picture or use a whiteboard. And all of these modalities that we just like seamlessly switch in between, and we just have this uh, perspective taking and like understanding of the other. And um, this is kind of how effective human-human communication is. Mm. AI, AI communication is also very effective because you don't need any of that social interaction stuff. <laughs> I can just like go but ahead we and we actually like, don't know that, right? They I mean, this is how these systems are designed, right? Yeah. Um, but then, but then in, we ask ourselves, like, what is an ideal human AI communication? And I would like it to be a multimodal, like um, using multiple different interactions techniques, verbal, visual, auditory, and so on, um, an interaction that would allow you to actually assess a perspective of the other. Mm -hmm. So we're learning a lot of trying to identify human intent based on their actions mm -hmm. to try to understand what is their perspective. 
and in an interaction that wouldn't kind of go down a rabbit hole and not be able to uh, dig itself out of it. Because imagine you have this co-adaptive, co-evolving system, and it's learning from everything that you say. And all of a sudden, you leave and get a coffee, and your cat walks over the keyboard. You don't want this to be a learned pattern. <laughs> um, if, you, if you have something, and you want the AI to forget about past patterns, you, you bought something for a friend, and you don't want it to learn this forever, you, you want to learn from the non-interaction. You want to learn also from from maybe adapt the learning rate. Like there's a lot of these things about timing and about what you actually learn that will make the seamless interaction come to life. And there is a lot more research to be done to make it happen. That's cool. I think there's questions of what will the interface of how you'll interact with these things be. Mm -hmm. Could be many different things. So, you know, we said multimodal here. Um, if we look at our previous new technologies, they didn't really replace the thing that went before it. They just moved aside a little. You know, I still use my lap. I still use a desktop computer in one place. Still use a laptop. Still use a tablet. Still use a phone. Still use a watch. They all just kind of move things aside in a ring, um, mm -hmm. and change it a little. I think these interfaces we're going to see are going to do a similar. Maybe they'll do a bigger swath. Maybe not. Whether you'll have one application like. I have a health coach that's a personal health coach that actually understands my life and understands how to motivate me and doesn't make suggestions that don't make sense to me um, and therefore Now you're can talking work my well, language here. Right? There you go. I got that. <laughs> so one. whether that's all in your one AI agent or whether yeah. you have to run that special thing to do that, we don't really know yet. Mm -hmm. But we're going to have these different and we might have things that are different interactions because maybe language interaction, typing speech is good in certain situations, but I wouldn't want anyone, you know, talking to their AI too loud right here while we're talking, it would be kind of rude. So we're still gonna have different interaction modalities that depend on the situation that you're in. I, I, it's really, so I'm actually f super excited when I hear what you're talking about and I believe in it. It also concerns me, you know, both. I think all of us, it's a healthy, because it, it's a relationship. What we're talking about here is a relationship, and relationships are always complex. And this is why I think it's interesting to have this kind of a dialogue here, now, and constantly as we try to navigate this dialogue of a partnership, of a coexistence, of a relationship. So I think it's actually quite, quite, quite good to talk about those. We um, are almost out of time, but we're not quite. I'd love to ask a few questions. Uh, yeah, I, <laughs> yeah, yeah, this is, okay. So, Daniel, you got your hands up first, and then that, and then here for, in the front, and then we have it, and then, so we'll be here until about 10 o'clock tonight, instead of partying and having dinner, we're gonna have, let's just go ahead and throw it, pass it on down. <laughs> Speak to the AI in the box. And yeah, exactly. It's recording you, it's recording yeah. your, yeah, uh, thank you very much, very inspiring. My name is Daniel Stauffacher from ICT for Peace Foundation. And I wanted to pick up on your question on the harmony and what is needed. So I, another dimension would be, in my view, responsibility. Hmm. While we are creating this and while we are going through this journey which you described and also the sort of uh, ex external implications, uh, you know, we have the human AI individual relationship, and, and there I think also of, uh, of uh, social media, yeah. which is AI driven, yeah. and it's an interrelationship. Yeah. So, I as a participant, I have a responsibility not to lie, not to cheat, be ethical, but I think also um, science and the platforms, sorry, to come to the platforms, social media platforms, have a responsibility for the external implication of society. So, and so the question, we are, Daniel? We are, we are, propose, we are proposing. Yeah. It's more a proposal, sorry. So it's not it's, a question. It's, well, you oh, respond. Why am I not surprised, sir? No, <laughs> no, we are proposing to introduce the notion of external, externality cost of the negative impact for society. So also it's new AI. and it's, it's not regulation. Okay. It's a question of responsibility. Okay, thank you. Clear? Yeah. Thank you. Are we going to have the question? I do have a question indeed. Thank Ooh, you. Oh, it even works. <laughs> there you go. And I'll make it short. However, I, I think that we are taking ourselves a little bit short here. I, I like, Chris, that you are pointing out with the panel into the future. But what 
what distract me at the moment when I saw this panel was the word coexistence and partnership. Sorry, we are talking about the tool. And now the question is to you four experts, are, we, are you really in this world that you are thinking this tool is a partner with, in which we coexist? Or are, are we really in this, that level? Or what was your thinking when you have been invited to this panel? Oh, now that's yeah. a question. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Okay, who, we're gonna start with the A. Go for it. Yes. And then Mina, you so can my personal take is that, no, we're not yet there, I think. Neither in a, in a full partnership nor in a coexistent yet. But we also are usually very bad at predicting the future. Um, so we might be there in five years. or might be there in 10 years. Um, it, to me, at least, if, if, if I look at it very long term, uh, if, AI, if, if we really are able to develop models that are that are extremely good. You know, many different models are extremely good at many different aspects of our lives. What if we just become too reliant on them? And one thing we don't know, actually, because this would play over decades, of, is how, how will we change in terms of our behavior, in terms of our brain, and so on, uh, if once we start becoming over-reliant on a specific tool. Uh, I think it's maybe something that we, we might want to think about at some point. It's an interesting question because I, I didn't. I mean, the externality question comes in as interesting <laughs> as well because we're talking that this coexistence with that. Exactly. Do you guys want to comment on this at all? I mean, I I I think of these as tools as well, but these are also yeah. metaphors. You know, partnership is a metaphor that people have used in interface design. Coexistence goes a little more to saying this is some kind of being, which I totally disagree with. Yeah. I don't think it is, and I think we should be careful in the metaphors we use to not imply this technology as something much more than it is, because that just leads you to kind of this doomerish idea of intelligent AI taking over the world, and that's not possible with the kind of technology we're talking about. Okay, Mina, and then Gavin, go ahead. Just very briefly, I think the way that we currently think about these systems is that these are agents that are kind of having an intervention on something that you do. And you want to know that the intervention timing and also content is correct in order for it to be helpful and to feel like a partnership and to feel like it's helping you coexist in that environment. Um, so the topic of agency is actually a very important topic um, that still has no proper solution. Like we are, have a lot of models and a lot of like good examples, but like not one single thing that would actually solve this whole partnership yeah. great and the final comment and yeah, my final comment is, is that basically um, I think people um, are sometimes mislead uh, about what's actual what's what are actually the the potentials and lim limitations of you know like different AI models different robotic systems so I think we should be fully transparent you know like the developers of those systems need to be transparent which are the capabilities of the systems and which are the limitations and humans ourselves we need to be as well acknowledging that that's a technology that's a tool uh, it's AI is a very powerful tool, and as a very powerful tool, it needs like has its risks and opportunities, and and it's and, and this needs you know like uh, uh, guardrails you know like for for a safe development and respons responsible AI. That was the final comment. Thank you. It's quite interesting to me the journey we've gone on right now, and we're gonna have to call it to an end because otherwise we're gonna have the terrible fate of people's trickling out, and no one really likes that. I'm sorry we're not going to be able to question. You can ask them afterwards. It has been a true pleasure for me to host this conversation. I've learned from you. I'm inspired by you. And I'm, I'm looking forward to the, the various aspects that you're working on, perhaps coming back here next year and sharing where you've gotten <laughs> to with your thinking if it's changed. And we're thinking about this word of coexistence, which you challenged. But I think it's a really good one for us to think about. Thank all of you very much for choosing to be here tonight and to the AI House to hosting this. So let's thank them. Really great.
please kindly exit the room through the valley floor door following the exit signs.